Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast as we continue reading Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss by Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. Publisher is Productivity Press 2022. On to chapter one. Why do people get stuck? A couple of quotes for you to think about. Wrap your noodle noggin around. We're only as needy as our unmet needs by John Bowlby. Memory is the diary that we all carry about with us by Oscar Wilde. Oh help, oh bother, I'm stuck. Winnie the Pooh. An OG. <laughs> this book should have had a different opening. We were going to ask you to imagine a morning where your world had shifted, where your routines were run amok, your schedule disturbed, your very approach to work changed, and maybe where you just woke up and couldn't find your phone. We would have asked you, how did you react? Of course, this is no longer some thought exercise. For most of us around the world, 2020 was a year when everything changed. So how did you react? What did you feel? Were you upset? Were you anxious? If you lost your job, how did you feel? If you worked from home, what did you miss? What did you long for? Was it a person you saw every day? Some item on your desk? A feeling of comfort in your position or role? Stability? Predictability? Childcare? Peace and quiet? Throughout the ongoing global pandemic, we all lost something. Some were lucky to lose only the small comforts. Some lost much more. No matter the size of the loss, we all reacted with the same biological response. It is a biological response that has been with us since the early days of evolution. It resides in our brain. It explains how we form relationships with other people, with groups, and with organizations. This biological function explains how we perform, how we lead, how we motivate, and how we are motivated. It explains how we respond to and engage with culture and how we adapt to change. This biological mechanism explains why we sometimes embrace the shifting organizational landscape, but so often get stuck. Work is changing. Every day, new companies, technologies, and ideas emerge that impact how and where we work. Technology companies and service providers were 42 of the Fortune 500 companies in 2020 and two of the three largest companies in the world, Apple and Amazon. More importantly, seven of the eight largest research and development budgets in the world belong to software, internet, and computing companies that in 2018 spent a staggering $107 billion on research and development. The outlying company, Volkswagen, a car manufacturer that is trying to bring more technology into its brands. All this investment presents a range of opportunities for the future of our technology and work. Moreover, these stats were all pre-pandemic, before any organizational leadership teams were convinced that a technology-enabled and distributed workplace could be the future. Despite this exciting evolution, people remain the heart of organizations. People are tricky. People don't seem to evolve as fast as our global environment. We get stuck. Leaders, managers, and teammates struggle with resistance from their colleagues and get frustrated. Frustrated people dig in their heels and convince others. This impacts the performance of our organizations. And now, instead of just being, instead of just a person being stuck, our whole organization is stuck. We set out to answer one seemingly simple question. Why do people get stuck? It turns out, Most people aren't actually stuck. They are just going through a process. It is a deeply human process, even a biological process. It is rooted in our brain and the way our brain interacts with everything in the world, even work. 
It is how our brain controls our interactions with technology, our connection with peers, our perception of leaders, the way we view our organizations, and even our connection to the communities where we live. All of these factors impact how we perform as individuals at work and ultimately how organizations perform in the global workplace. We are not stuck. We are working through a process of attachment and subsequent feelings of loss. Attachment behavior is an instinctual response born out of our earliest days of life that impacts how we connect and interact with the world around us. Through this process, we are also introduced to loss. Those who learn to understand loss through attachment behavior and the attachments of others will succeed. The organizations, leaders, and managers who understand these concepts will evolve with the future. Those organizations that understand loss, sorry, those organizations that understand attachment can achieve business wins. Loss is something we all know. Loss is when there is something you expected to be there that is unexpectedly gone. We have all felt it and understand what it does to us and others. Just as the losses of the early days of the global pandemic required a massive shift in the way we work and operate, there are many other losses we have on a regular basis. Have you ever lost your keys, misplaced your phone, lost a family pet, moved from one city to another, moved locations at work from one floor to another, watched your child go to their first day of kindergarten, 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 watched your child go to their first day of kindergarten, lost job responsibilities, had a favorite reader, fuck, had a favorite leader reassigned, The feelings you had in these moments were probably not that different than the uncertainty you may have had in the early days of the pandemic. This sense of loss is attachment. It is a powerful biological instinct that impacts how we interact with people, organizations, and even communities. It is a normal part of human development and here to now, it has been largely ignored in the workplace. But it shouldn't be ignored. It is the root of much behavior, and we simply must understand loss if we want to win at work. Baseball, Books, and Blankets As Billy Bean introduced the world of baseball to his unique and analytical style of managing a team, he also inspired a business and cultural revolution in the world of sports. Michael Lewis fully recounts the story in the book Moneyball. The story follows the rise of the Oakland A's through the 2002 Major League Baseball season. The concept of analytics to determine the strategic direction of a sports team has since become a given. Basketball teams measured the release points of shots as a metric for offense and possible defense. Football's obsession with strength and speed has been enhanced with measures of angles and distance. While even tennis has gotten in the game by looking at common serve placements as a tool for defensive strategy. Analytics of sports is everywhere, and the leaders in this space are seeking the non-obvious connections between data and results that will help them gain an edge. Sounds obvious today, but it was a battle for Billy. Billy Bean was battling a hundred year old or more way of thinking about how leaders build a team, how managers manage a game, how pitchers and batters address an at bat. In short, Bean had to take on the culture of baseball. Players and talent scouts spent a lifetime developing their instincts for the game and Bean undercut it all. Instead of leveraging hardened expertise, Bean and his team relied on the data to determine key decisions. They placed a bet that by using data, they could turn their mid-market team with one of the lowest total budgets into a competitor with the big guys. 
Along the way, Billy had to change all the minds. The owners, the managers, the players, the media, and the fans. In the film version of Moneyball, this challenge comes to a head in a single moment when Bean is talking to an older scout, Grady. For years, scouts like Grady have been on the road looking for the next great talent. They have an eye and groom young, moldable, skilled men into baseball stars. Sometimes, sometimes it does not work out. And Billy was one that did not work out. The conversation starts ominously when Grady says, Billy, can we talk? Billy responds, you're unhappy. Grady says, may I speak candidly? Billy, sure, go ahead. Grady, Major League Baseball and its fans are going to be more than happy to throw you and Google Boy under the bus if you keep doing what you're doing here. You don't put a team together with a computer, Billy. Billy, no. Grady, no. Baseball isn't just numbers. It's not science. If it was, then anyone could do what you're doing. But they can't because they don't know what we know. They don't have our experience, and they don't have our intuition. Billy. Okay. Grady. Billy. You got a kid in there with an economics degree from Yale. You got a scout here with 29 years of baseball experience. You are listening to the wrong one. Now, there are intangibles that only baseball people understand. You're discounting what scouts have done for 150 years, even yourself. Billy, adapt or die, with an emphatic hand clap. <laughs> Billy, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't look at a kid and predict his future any more than I can. And Grady says, Major League Baseball thinks the way I think. You're not going to win. Grady goes on to provide some personal insults, to which Bean responds, I'm not going to fire you, Grady. Then the scout shoves him and Bean fires the scout. Was the scout wrong? No. He had a strong, lifelong understanding of the game of baseball, and it made him a valuable asset to the A's organization. But Bean had a vision of what could be done in the future, and that conflicted with baseball's known and certain past. The scout represents a different type of attachment. For him, it is an attachment to culture, to what he knows, to the way things have been done around here, quote unquote. In 1999, when a student started college, they would go to the bookstore and dutifully find the books for the courses they were taking that semester down one or more many rows, down one of many rows of overflowing books. They would assess the total number of books for the class, the cost of these books, and they would decide whether to drop the class. Kidding. They would pick up the many different books and ask a roommate to haul them back to the dorm to avoid the risk of injury in the first week of class. All right, and I guess it's just kidding after kidding. Today, the incoming class of future graduates likely bought their books in their room and downloaded all the content to an e-reader with the only risk of injury being neck pain from laying awkwardly while looking for Thucydides? 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 What happened? It says, what happened? While looking for Thucydides. So, I mean, they're still studying the classics. Oh no, man, maybe too much studying of the classics by the elites causes repetition. A? <laughs> what happened? It asks. We all know the story of the lost bookstore in the wake of Amazon and the shift to digital content, but let's look at the physical object of the e-reader. Prior to broad-based digital content, reading happened with a book, snuggled up in bed or with a cup of coffee, struggling to keep the right page while balancing the other aspects of life. And while the digital revolution is partly to account for today's success in digital books, something else happened. The e-reader. 
Today, there are two camps in the world of voracious readers, the Loyalist Books Camp and the New Age E-Reader Camp. The Loyalists are dealing with an attachment to both an object, the book, and a preferable experience, the act of holding the book. The New Age readers have moved past this attachment into the era of the e-reader. But were they destined to be digital readers? Probably not. Reading on a computer screen is very is a very reading on a computer screen is a very different experience from reading a physical book. One must sit up in bed with the computer in your lap, or worse, sit at a desk. The e-reader is not simply a digital format. It is the recreation of the written word consumption that book readers love in a digital format. In fact, even the language of the e-reader implies that the device is meant to be something other than a book or a computer. It is called paperwhite, nook, or books with an X. It can be snuggled with and it can sit next to your coffee while you contemplate whether your characters really should do what they just did. For both camps in this new religious war, the physical object has become the attachment. The words are the same, the story is the same, and even the experience is the same, but each prefers their way of reading. For the books camp, it is a little attachment to the culture of books in addition to the object. For the e-reader crowd, for the e-reader crowd, they have found what we call a transitional object. This is a new physical object that takes the place of a former attachment and helps ease the sense of loss that comes with the new way of doing things. Billy and Grady's exchange may sound familiar. It happens at work on a regular basis. There is tension between new and old ways of doing work, digital versus paper, data versus intuition, automation versus manual. Maybe you are an e-reader or a book loyalist. You may have these conversations on a regular basis with your parents, your children, or your friends, but it may also remind you of something more basic. Have you ever watched a child hold a cherished toy or blanket tight? Have you ever seen a child in panic trying to find their favorite stuffed animal right before bed? It is not too different from watching an adult who has lost or temporarily misplaced their phone. The panic and sense of anxiety is real. There is a sense of loss. No one is better at watching, understanding, and mirroring children than Charles Schultz, the creator of Charlie Brown and Peanuts, the comic. And he also understood attachment. That's right, the cartoonist. His Peanuts showed the his Peanuts cartoon showed the life and development of children in simple drawings with complex themes. Charlie Brown and his dog Snoopy explore the wider world of suburbia with a cast of friends who represent the myriad of possible personalities born from just a few simple pen strokes. But each character is much more complex and effectively represents adult behavior. One character with such complexity is Linus Van Pelt. He references philosophers and poets worships the coming of the great pumpkin, and serves as the voice of reason to remind the children of the true meaning of Christmas. And Linus has one companion through all of his journey, his baby blue blanket. The blanket goes everywhere and serves as a prop for Linus in many facets of life. He uses it as a headdress, a slingshot, a hammock, a kite, a sports coat and a scarf. Sounds like sounds like my knife. Sounds like a pocket knife. You never want to go anywhere. I at least I, Alex, never want to go anywhere without a pocket knife. A knife, some kind of sharp of some kind. Linus finds any occasion to ensure the blanket's close contact and often doubles the comfort with a thumb in his mouth. Sounds like my gun. A knife and a gun. <laughs> 
The blanket first appeared on June 1st, 1954. Just, just real quick, just a side note, commentary. I mean, if we're talking about uh, priorities, priority number one, have a knife. Don't go anywhere where knives aren't allowed. And I mean, obviously, it's nice to always be carrying your gun, but there's going to be instances where you can't just, you know, walk out your place with a gun in hand or a gun by your side or a gun in your shoulder, right? There's just going to be those times when you just can't. So first, first best is the knife. Second best is always the gun. And, you know, the gun is a last resort. As the saying goes, where did it go? The blanket. The blanket first appeared on June 1st, 1954 in a four-panel comic strip. Charlie Brown asks Linus' sister Lucy, why does Linus hold this blanket like that? In the second panel, she responds, I'm not sure. I think maybe it gives him a feeling of security. In the third panel, Charlie Brown walks away from Lucy. In the final panel, we see him holding his own blanket as he exclaims, It doesn't work. I feel like an idiot. Linus and his blanket popularized the term security blanket, and it seems Schultz, the author, the cartoonist, intended to make the connection to attachment. Schultz regularly played bridge with a neighbor, Fritz Van Pelt, the same last name used for Linus. During the repeated sessions, Schultz would hide the favorite stuffed animal of Van Pelt's daughter. The elder Van Pelt once told Schultz that he should stop doing it. He explained that the stuffed animal is an important bridge between the parent and the rest of the world. Van Pelt had read some studies in psychology and explained the work of D.W. Winnicott, who studied security in children. Schultz took it to heart and created Linus's quote-unquote security blanket. As a critic and novelist, Sarah Boxer notes, Linus knew that he could take his blows philosophically as long as he had his security blanket nearby. As the comic evolves, so does Linus's devotion to the blanket. It becomes more intense. He chooses the blanket over everything. Toys, love interests, even his favorite teacher. Sounds like my knife and gun, y'all. <laughs> it is not, quote unquote, it is, it is not a, quote unquote, nice to have. It is a necessity. In a later strip, he threatens the lovable Snoopy for even eyeing the blanket. Linus warns, make one move toward this blanket, you stupid beagle, and I'll destroy all hopes you have for the future. Again, we see a common theme. In a world of only children, the adults never appear in the cartoon, one child demonstrates the challenges of loss. This is not to say attachment is a childish feeling, it is not. Attachment is a human behavior that is illustrated through the child of Linus. What Linus holds in his blanket is a transitional object, which is a powerful tool for supporting individuals through the process of loss and change. Adults today have many physical objects that help them through periods of loss in the workplace. Whether it is the following whether it is following the loss of a leader, a trusted software, or a job responsibility, the idea of transitional objects is to serve as a security blanket for the team member who was struggling with the change. These three stories about baseball, books, and blankets present characters who have an attachment to something in their lives, a person, a culture, or an object that they do not want to let go. Attachments are not bad, they just are. These attachments provide support, many times unconsciously, in the face of change. The scout's attachment to the Oakland A's has positive qualities. Attachment to culture is valuable for sustaining a well-established and proven way of doing things. Many companies would love to have this level of commitment from their workforce, but it is an attachment that yields tension when there is a new vision or approach to the future that is introduced. 
again, this attachment is not bad. It just, it just must be understood. Again, this attachment is not bad. It just must be understood. In the war of the written word, both camps have attachments to objects. Both are right and potentially wrong to have these attachments. For the e-readers of the world, that attachment provides a sense that things have not changed that much. They just have greater access to information faster. For book lovers, things haven't changed that much as they still have their books for most titles. Like the book lovers and e-readers, Linus has found his object that helps him through the tough times. His security blanket helps him connect with the world around him while holding some confidence in tiny hand. Because he's a child, he has a tiny hand, okay. As it is with these three examples, so it is with the workers in our global organizations. We all have attachments. They are not good or bad. They just are. But when you are trying to make a change, it is likely these attachments may be the visible signs of the deeper process of attachment. Visuals like a commitment to baseball, blankets, or books might be a sign that someone is stuck. How to work with stuck. The purpose of our work is to answer the question, why do people get stuck? The purpose of this book is to explain how our work and the research we have conducted can help you more effectively manage yourself, your teams, and your organization. As such, this book is full of academic research that is distilled into practical lessons. We are sharing with you more than 20 years of research, data gathering, and consulting engagements through stories that we hope will make the concepts more relatable and workable in your organization. Victoria has developed three different survey-based assess assessments. Victoria has developed three different survey-based assessments that she has administered to over 20,000 respondents across 150 organizations over the last 20 years. Patrick has advised C-suite executives in the private sector and the public sector on strategy, change management, and the use of analytics. Together, we have applied our methodology to a massive data set of public sector personnel and used our research in the instruction of hundreds of academic and private sector students. We use the feedback from all of these engagements to improve and enhance our research. This book includes lessons and original stories from the application of attachment concepts in more than 150 organizations across all sectors around the globe. The best way to think of this book is as a modern playbook for managing an organization by starting with the brain. We hope it provides a more detailed approach to concepts you may already know intuitively or at a base level and gives you the rationale, research, or data to support what you have felt. We want this book to help you where you are and we know people engage differently. As such, this book includes many different ways to engage with the concepts. Some sections based in theory, some based on stories, and some based on data. Read what works for you. Like a playbook, we are also giving you ways to practice and apply what you have learned throughout the book. We want this to be an experience for you through which you can grow in your understanding of the concepts and also apply them directly to your life. Each chapter ends with a few practical exercises that will help you reflect, observe, collect, apply, and analyze some components of the chapter. Most of these can be done alone, but in some cases, we provide options for you to try the activities in a group. So, why do people get stuck? It is due to a process called attachment that starts in the limbic system of our brain. This is our intuitive brain. Attachment is the human need to lean on tangible 
and or intangible objects for support. We will start the next chapter by explaining how the journey of the brain led us to attachment. The brain's journey is our journey in chapter two. Why do I get stuck in chapter three? How do I get stuck in chapter four? What do I get stuck to in chapter five? How does culture get stuck in chapter six? Is my organization stuck in chapter seven? Leading a stuck organization in chapter eight? Unsticking the future in chapter nine. In chapter two, we will explain how the brain evolved from its primitive beginnings and focus on survival to become a complex calculator of social algorithms. In this chapter, you will learn how the intuitive brain formed and how this part of the brain serves our attachment process today. This is the part of the brain where we get stuck. In the next few chapters, we will focus on how attachment relates to you as an individual. We will describe the attachment process in chapter three and how it forms from our earliest day as an infant and evolves through our life. We will see how attachment stays with us as we grow into adults and continues with us to the workplace. We will explore how attachment and loss are connected and which attachment symptoms reveal themselves as we experience loss. We will also learn that attachments form and shift as we grow, meaning that attachments can be shaped. From this, we will learn the critical role that experience plays in attachment, leading to different attachment styles and favoritism for different attachment objects in our, our, for our, our next two chapters. In chapter four, we will learn that not all people have the same type of attachment style. This means we stick differently. We will learn some of the advantages and disadvantages of different attachment styles to understand how we might work with different styles in the workplace. We will share what we have seen from an assessment called the Attachment Styles Index. Now it's copyrighted. Pretty cool, huh? Now they can just coin, they can coin an index like that. There is even an opportunity to assess yourself and see what this might tell you about how you behave in the workplace based on your attachment style. In chapter five, we will move on to the objects that support us through the attachment process. Here, we will learn the different types of objects, people, places, things, ideas that we lean on for support in organizations. We will also discuss the important role of objects in helping people transition from a current state to a future state. Those are capitalized, capital, current state, and capital future state. It's pretty dope. These transitional objects are a special type of object in the attachment space. They are tools in the arsenal of change leaders. Again, we will provide you the opportunity to assess yourself and try to discuss some of your preferences for attachment objects. Over the following three chapters, we will move from the individual to the organization. And in chapter six, takes on the light topic of culture. That's very light, right? Peter Drucker wrote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Sounds like a fucking light breakfast, right? But he also said company cultures are like country cultures. Never try to change one. Try instead to work with what you've got. We try to take a more hopeful view and explain why an attachment-based understanding of culture helps demystify what culture is within an organization and therefore makes it more possible to shape organizational culture. In this chapter, we will explore some of the key elements of culture that support a co-creation approach to culture. In this way, leaders can help create a culture that sticks without creating a culture that makes people feel stuck. Mm, okay. Chapter seven is about what happens when organizations get stuck. This chapter highlights data from the Change Diagnostic Index, a survey that has been taken by more than 18,000 people across 125 organizations. We will see how leadership emerges as the top challenge for managing attachment at the organizational level. 
we will discuss how attachment challenges emerge at all levels of leadership and some of the ways these can be mitigated. In Chapter 7, we give you the opportunity to assess your organization and determine what attachment challenges you may be likely to face within your organization. In Chapter 8, we will focus on the tools that leaders need to work with attachment behavior to support people and create healthy attachments in organizations. We will outline five critical tools to implement organizational change. We will discuss how common tools like communication, training, and performance management can be enhanced through a better understanding of attachment. Additionally, we will reframe the critical role of leadership and transitional objects in the context of major organizational change programs. Lastly, in Chapter 9, we will try to predict the future, or at least learn from the recent past. We will look at some of the trends in organizations to understand how an attachment lens helps leaders and employees respond differently to particular situations. Whether it is the recent pandemic, the challenge to diversify our organizations, the need to become more data-driven, or the desire to build resiliency, our organizations need to evolve to become nimbler. For this to happen, people need to become more aware of their own attachment and what keeps them stuck. Many people feel stuck. Stuck in their jobs, stuck in different parts of work, stuck in their ability to move programs and projects along, stuck in their ability to drive change. Do you feel stuck? What if there was one little biological function that determines how well you will perform at work, how well you will interact with others in the workplace, how well you lead, how well you follow, how well you assimilate to the culture of an organization, and most importantly, how well you adapt to a change? What if one biological function could, change, could explain all of that? What if one biological function could explain all of that? Would you want to understand it? Or would you be content to stay where you are? Will you stay stuck? Some practical exercises. Reflect on getting stuck. The process of getting stuck to relationships and organizations happens over time. This first reflection is a warm-up exercise to get you in the habit of thinking about your past and how it impacts where you are today. There are two possible ways to think about this. You can choose to think about a relationship or you can think about your work organization. Pick one or do both, we don't know. Now answer the questions below based on how Sorry, now answer the questions below based on which one you chose. As to relationships, do you remember your first interaction with the person? Do you remember your first sight, sound, smell with the person? What is the emotion you recall in this relationship with the person? What is the first shared experience you recall with the person? Something you did together. How long have you had this relationship? How would you describe your relationship with the person today? How would you describe your emotions about this person today? If someone saw this relationship from the outside, how would they describe it? And as to organizations, do you remember your first interaction with the organization? You met at a conference, you saw an ad, a recruiting event, an interview event, an outreach. Do you remember the first visual you saw from the organization or a person you met from the organization? What is the emotion you recall in your initial interactions with this first person or group of people? How would you describe this person or group of people? How long have you been with the organization? Would you describe yourself as similar to the person or group of people you first met from the organization? How would you describe your emotions about the organization today? How would an outsider describe the organization? How would an outsider describe your relationship with the organization? 
and now reflect. Something changed, part one. Do you remember a time that something significant changed at your work? It might be at your current organization or at a former organization. What was the change that happened? How big was the change? How many people did it impact in the organization? How did it personally impact you? How did you feel about the change? Were you quick to adapt to the change or were you slow to change? If you were quick, do you know why? If you were slow, do you know why? What do other people in the organization, what about other people in the organization? Were they quick to adapt to the change or were they slow? If they were quick, do you know why? If they were slow, do you know why? Consider writing down some thoughts about this now. Seriously, we are going to come back to this topic in future chapters, so it would be good to be able to reference your initial reactions. That is the end of chapter one of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. Authors are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. Publisher is Productivity Press. Published... 2022 hosted by the corporate cowboys podcast narrated by alex the corporate cowboy powered by incorporating associates you can follow us on patreon keep this operation non-profit and free it's the corporate cowboys podcast on instagram you can find us it's corporate cowboys with a z you'll recognize the profile. And if you want to shoot us a donation, by all means do that. There are a couple of links floating around, a PayPal, a Venmo, a uh, Cash App. And until then, have a nice one. I'm out.